Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, my friends, wherever you might be, and thanks for joining me. In this video, I'm going to walk through how to prep a pre-written dungeon crawl using Pathfinder 2's exploration mode. But before we begin, thank you to everyone who asked a question or shared their experience on my last video on exploration mode. Your questions and feedback were really helpful in understanding what to focus on in this video. For our example today, we're going to look at the first four rooms of the Pathfinder 2 beginner's box. Now, I know the beginner's box is written to teach players about specific mechanics, and that if you were going to use the approach that I'm going to discuss here today with new players, they could miss some of those teaching opportunities. So if your players and table are brand, brand new to Pathfinder 2, take some of this advice with a grain of salt and consider saving some of these changes for your second Pathfinder 2 adventure. I'm using the beginner's box as an example, since if you're already playing Pathfinder 2, chances are you either already played the adventure and are familiar with it, or you don't have it on your list of adventures to play in the future, so spoilers don't matter quite as much. But speaking of spoilers, in the next 10 minutes or so, we are going to thoroughly spoil the first four rooms of the dungeon. For each room, I'm going to read through the entry and note three things. Key information and clues the characters can uncover with exploration activities, obstacles the party must overcome, and times that the players may go into encounter mode. This gives us a skeleton of events and secrets we can assign DCs to, and we'll know when to look back at our module for monster or more complex trap stat blocks. Also, as we go, you'll notice I'm focusing my notes on information outside the read aloud text, the green text meant to be read to players when they enter a new area. If something is mentioned in the read aloud text, you should assume it's something very obvious, which every character would notice regardless of what exploration activity they're using. Whether you're sharing the read aloud text directly or you're summarizing in your own words, that represents a baseline of what every character perceives, even if they're doing something else like avoiding notice or repeating a spell. To get more detailed information though, the character will need to perform a specific exploration activity. Our adventure starts with the players descending into the basement of the Otari fishery. Outside the green text, the adventure mentions general supplies stacked on the north and south sides of the room and notes the debris surrounding the hole in the east wall suggesting something burrowed in from the other side. Both pieces of information foreshadow the culprits of the robbery and their motives, and are perfect to provide players taking the investigate action. That said, neither clue seems like it would require any specific training, so I won't add any checks or proficiency thresholds. The characters can just know these pieces of information if they take their time with the investigation activity as they move through the area. There aren't any traps or hidden objects, so for searching players, they probably wouldn't find anything. Similarly, players who are scouting may see the rats and hear them scurrying down the tunnel before they burst into the room, but that's already more or less accounted for in the plus one initiative bonus granted by that activity, so there's nothing further for them as well. The giant rats are our first encounter, so I'm going to mark that as a natural breakpoint. Next up is the drop into darkness. Besides describing how to navigate the cliff, the drop into darkness doesn't seem to have any new information for the players outside the read aloud text. Since there's no encounter in the drop into darkness, we'll look at the spider's web room next and move right into that when we're narrating in exploration mode. This room notes a kobold wrapped in the spider webs. The module recommends a DC 15 perception check so we'll automatically grant a secret check to notice the kobold to anyone using the search activity. Then there are the webs themselves. Upon first entering, a player might be curious about the source of the webs, so I'm going to add a potential piece of information revealing the giant spider itself for characters investigating, giving them a DC 15 nature check to recall knowledge. As a side note, adding free recall knowledge checks to identify a creature while players are taking the investigate exploration activity is a great way to provide mechanical benefit to that activity and also encouraging more interesting tactics when the players do get into encounter mode since they'll already have a bit of a basis on which to plan. Navigating the webs is another obstacle which the players will have to overcome after receiving any information from their search or investigate activities. 
We've got our information and clues all squared away, all the way through the potential encounter with the spider. Now back to the obstacles. For the cliff, I'm going to scrap all of the checks written out in the module. Now I understand why they did it in the beginner's box. It's meant to teach how skill checks and degrees of success work. But our goal with this exercise is to keep things moving narratively without adding a bunch of dice rolls. Instead, I'm going to say that anyone who is trained proficiency in athletics can automatically climb down, no check needed. I'll also allow someone to replace that proficiency with a tool, like a rope, or if they explain how they're using a different skill or ancestry ability and if that makes sense in the fiction. Perhaps an expert in acrobatics could gracefully slide down. Otherwise, I'd narrate that any other player without a way to descend took two damage from falling debris and scratches as they slipped their way down without any particular tools or training. The spiderweb obstacle is another story. And for that, I am going to have everyone make the DC 15 acrobatics check called for in the adventure. Now, why am I treating those differently? It all comes down to the stakes of success and failure on the narrative. For the cliff, we know everyone is eventually going to make it down. Otherwise, the adventure would basically end right here for one or more characters. Now, it is helpful for the story to narrate the challenges of traversing this area, and it feels good when players are rewarded for things their characters are good at. But we can do that in a sentence or two, ask for a few proficiencies, and move on. On the other hand, having one character get stuck in the web and seeing that giant spider descending towards them, or having everyone succeed and feel like special forces because they're sneaking past this intimidating threat, both of those outcomes are interesting, they're dramatic, and they can potentially branch the narrative. My rule of thumb is call for skill checks for those types of high stakes obstacles with multiple interesting outcomes and use proficiency thresholds for obstacles which don't. Before we get to the barricade, let's flush out what we have so far and how these scenes can run at the table. Once I read the read aloud text for the first room of the dungeon, the basement of the fishery, I'm going to start by asking players what their goals in this moment are and what exploration activity they would be taking because of that. Goals might be things like, I'm looking for clues on what types of creatures might be down here, which I would confirm with the player was the investigate action, or I want to look out for danger, which I would help the player get more specific with which action they are taking. Now, this brings up a common question I saw on the last video. How do you avoid player frustration when you tell them they have to pick a single exploration activity? This can be a hard pill to swallow for D&D players in particular, since passive perception basically replaces investigate, scout, and search, and you can do something else at the same time. For me, I think this all depends on how exploration activities are framed. When a player says they want to look out for danger, I ask them how they would envision their character doing that as they move along. Are you watching the shadows or overgrowth for movement or listening for footsteps? Then you're scouting. Are you looking down at the floor and looking along the walls for trip wires and hidden seams? Then you're searching. Are you skimming the titles of bookshelves? Are you picking up samples of plant life to see if you recognize them? Then you're investigating. And if you're more focused on locating objects to hide behind or avoiding squeaky floorboards, you're probably not doing any of the above at the same time as you're avoiding notice. When it's explained as where your character's attention is focused, it helps make more sense in the fiction that an individual character can't pay attention to all of those things all at once without slowing their travel pace to a crawl. It's not that your character can't see anything else around them, that's what the read aloud text is for, but for things beyond the obvious, you're generally focused on one thing at a time. Once the players have explained what their goals are and we've chosen exploration activities, I compare the list of activities with the information or events that will happen between now and the next encounter. And then I begin narrating, pausing for checks and revealing information along the way. As the last of the rats fall silent, we are back in exploration mode. Does anyone want to change their exploration activities? All right. Alex, you already investigated the basement and it seems the only way forward is from the direction the rats came. Squeezing through that hole, you find yourself in a cavern that seems to stretch endlessly beneath the streets of Otari. Up ahead, the passageway ends in a cliff that plunges sharply into the darkness. Anyone with training in athletics think they can pretty easily climb their way down. 
If you don't have that proficiency, let me know if you can think of another way to descend. Okay, Alex and Barry, you can make it down just fine. But Chris, without training or tools, you suffer a few scrapes as you fall a little harder than you intended the last five or so feet and take two points of bludgeoning damage. The tunnel continues deeper underground, eventually opening into a large chamber. Patches of glowing blue fungus cling to the ceiling and provide dim light. You can just barely make out vast strands of webbing across the floors and walls of this cavern. Chris, as you continue to search for secrets and hazards, you notice a small bundle of bones and dried skin wrapped in the webs in one of the corners of the room. Alex, as you investigate the webs, you think back to your druidic training. It's clear that a large spider dwells here, but you're not quite sure what type it is, or if it has any weaknesses. At any rate, chances are you might find out sooner than you'd like, as both the path to the bundle of bones, as well as the exit on the other side of the cavern, will require some careful acrobatics checks to avoid stumbling into the webs. What will you do next? Players may want to swap exploration activities midway through your narration. That's okay if in the fiction the party is pausing to reassess their course of action, but try to avoid letting a player switch every time another character finds some piece of information because they want to investigate that too. Let them know that their character was busy focusing their attention elsewhere and they wouldn't have noticed that detail unless the investigating player called the group to a halt and communicated it. You may also run into situations where the players have conflicting ideas. After defeating the rats, for example, one player may say, I want to search the basement further, while the other one says, well, I want to move into the hole in the wall. In this situation, ask each player to focus on why their characters are doing those things. If both the player who wants to search the basement and the player who wants to move forward into the tunnels are doing so because they want to learn more about the types of creatures that might have caused the damage, both of them would be using the investigate exploration activity to keep an eye out for droppings, tracks, claw marks, or other clues, regardless of where their character physically was when they started doing that. If the player who wanted to move into the tunnel says they were more concerned about direct threats, maybe defend or scout is more appropriate for what they want to do. A number of folks mentioned player agency as a concern with the narrative approach, and I think this is why, with some practice, that becomes less of an issue or concern. In this example, I'm not telling the player who wants to stay around and explore the basement, no, you have to go down the tunnel because that's where the adventure is, that's where the rest of the party is going. Instead, I'm figuring out why they want to do the thing that they're doing, which lets them still express their agency and includes their character in the narrative. If both characters want to investigate, but in different directions, you can say, after a quick sweep of the basement leaves no further clues as to the type of the creature other than that they burrowed from the inside of the tunnels, you descend into the hole. Both characters just did what they wanted to do without spending a bunch of time debating whether or not to move forward or which part of the basement they were going to search. Each player can have their character's goals acknowledged, and the story can progress. The final section of the beginner's box we'll review in this video is probably the thing that trips up people most when using exploration mode in dungeons, and that is branching paths. How do you manage when there are multiple rooms or multiple paths for the characters to potentially search? After the players end their encounter with the spider and re-enter exploration mode, they proceed to a barricade and the tunnel branching off the main path. In traditional D&D, the GM might ask players, which way do you go? And then 10 minutes would pass as players describe gathering the information they need in order to make an informed decision. These will be things like players checking for tracks, tossing torches and stones with light on them into the darkness, listening for noises, inspecting objects. I use exploration actions that the character chose to make the characters feel more insightful and heroic and jump the story directly to those interesting decisions. Reading through the room description, there is a faint clattering down the northern hallway, but as written, only players examining the barricade are able to make that check. The whole point of exploration mode is that players don't need to narrate their detailed actions. 
So I'm just going to give everyone a DC 15 perception check to hear that regardless of their exploration activity when they approach the barricade without specifically needing to describe their character examining it. The adventure also offers a crafting or thievery check to disassemble the barricade. Similar to the perception check, don't hide potential options from players unless they investigate specific elements of the room. This adds way more for the GM to remember which particular points of interest have particular pieces of information hidden behind them. And it also slows the game way down because it incentivizes players to ask to make perception checks or knowledge checks against every potential object in the room to try to discover those secret pieces of information. Because of that, I'm just going to narrate that anyone searching or investigating who's trained in crafting or thievery sees those weak points in the barricade and thinks it could be taken apart, but that it might be tiring or noisy work. Finally, I want to give players a bit more information on the choice that they're making. So for anyone who is investigating and trained in survival, I'm going to let them know they see faint slimy trails and recent tracks down the southern hallway but that the northern hallway hasn't seen foot traffic in years. That's going to be even weirder if they or some of the other players heard the clattering. Now is when you can ask which direction the players want to go. You've given them a good set of information to make their decisions based on the types of exploration actions they wanted to take. They'll still likely pause to discuss options, but rather than that laundry list of skill checks and questions, the discussion at the table can jump right to the moral and practical discussion. Should they focus on the fish thieves as they were hired to do? The southern path seems to be a clear route to that. Or should they clear out all potential menaces under Otari so they don't get ambushed later or those dangers could proceed above ground? One final note on using maps with branching paths and really just using maps in general during exploration mode. A number of folks in the comments in the last video asked about virtual tabletops and how this style of exploration play can work with VDTs. Virtual tabletops give you an option that's pretty hard to replicate at real life tables, and that is revealing a full-sized map of a dungeon five feet at a time, complete with line of sight, lighting, and all sorts of other special features. That type of video game style direct control of your character, that's pretty cool in its own right, but it's basically the opposite end of the exploration spectrum from the narrative style we're talking about here. The good news is you can do a narrative exploration with any VTT if you want. Rather than having the players move their tokens around the dungeon map, only share the dungeon map when the characters are in encounter mode. When you're in exploration mode, hide the dungeon map and replace it with something like a piece of art, similar to the location you're exploring as a thematic background. Keep this image shared until the party enters encounter mode again, and then when you switch back, move the character tokens to the new room and reshare the dungeon map. VTTs like Foundry or Fantasy Grounds can handle both the direct control and the narrative exploration mode well, but it's also cool to see VTTs that are aiming to specifically support one end of that exploration mode spectrum or the other. One More Multiverse is leaning into more of a direct video game-like control aesthetic, adding props and NPCs for players to click on as they move their characters around a room. On the other hand, Alchemy RPG is an example of a tool that goes in the opposite direction, focusing more on creating narrative scenes with grid-based maps being used pretty sparingly. While there are many more rooms in the menace under Otari, this is where our tale ends today. Let me know if you found this useful or what other questions it raises for you about exploration mode. We talked a lot about player goals today. My next channel goal is to release the video about the remainder of book one of Strength of Thousands. However, there was so much good discussion about exploration mode on my last video, I couldn't resist talking about it a little bit more. And I'm sure this won't be my last video on general Pathfinder 2 GM prep. But until the next time you join me, Thank you and take care.